Paz Latorena was the youngest among the four children of Florencia Manguera and Valentin Latorena. She was born on January 19, 1908 in Boac, Marinduque. She finished basic education at St. Scholastica's College in Manila and the Manila South High School. In 1926, she took up education at the University of the Philippines. In 1927, Latorena received an invitation from Benitez to write a column for the Philippines Herald magazine, of which Benitez was the literary editor. That same year, Latorena, along with other campus writers, founded the UP Writers Club. Latorena also wrote poetry under the pseudonym Minalis, which according to Tan Laiko, had a romantic significance for the then young writer. Before the year ended, the Marinduque native won the third prize in Jose Garcia Villas' Roll of Honor for the Best Stories of 1927 for her story, The Small Key. For her final year of college in 1927, Latorena transferred to USC to finish her education degree. She became the literary editor of our very own Versitalia. She shortly earned her master's and doctorate degree while teaching literature courses in UST. In 1934, her doctoral dissertation, Philippine Literature in English, Old Voices and New, received the highest rating of Sobre Saliente. In 1943, La Terena authored her last story, Miguel Comes Home. She died a decade after, on October 19, 1953, of cerebral hemorrhage. La Terena's works, as seen through the eyes of literary scholars, were thoroughly discussed through paper presentation. According to the Malanta, La Terena did not go by the modern plot standard, but her stories are not to be considered inferior, because both pre-war and post-war stories have to be studied in a different light. Her best three short stories, which established La Terena as a matriarch of Filipino writers in English, were Desire, The Small Key, and The Sunset. This is the life of Paz La Torena. That night, the rain lashed down the narrow street with the fury of an aroused maniac. A steady flood from a sky of impenetrable darkness. The water streamed along the gutters, foaming at the heaps of filth congested there. Rejected scraps of food, bits of yellow paper, pieces of rags, and untidy dirt. In what weather, no light shone along Barranco the heart of the slums of the northern district, early as the art still was. She came to me like a rabbit of flock sap, washed from the distant seas to the shore by uncertain tides. As the door slammed behind her, she hurried me. I was there sitting in my stool, doing my usual work, mending shoes. I eyed at her, leaning against the threshold, clutching a faded violet scarf tightly around her narrow chest. I look at her with a question, and she answered with a cough, because she was extremely wet by the rain. My house was the only place with a light that night. That is why she decided to come in. Without explaining further, she went to the door and decided to leave. I protested for her to stay until the rain stops. Her face lighted up with a tired smile. I sat her to the papag as she removed her wet scarf from her shoulders. I resumed my work. There were many questions in my mind. 
Where does she live? Is it far? She answered yes with a nod. I wanted to ask more, but I just glanced at her. A silence lengthened in minutes. I didn't notice that the rain already stopped. I was about to wake her up, but she had fallen asleep. She had dropped on one side. Drops of water still glistened on the mass of black hair that was knotted loosely at the back of her head. The large mouth with its full but colorless lips was lightly parted by her irregular breathing. Her closed eyes with their long lashes, the tips of which touched the soft brown of her cheeks. She opened her eyes and she started to panic to leave immediately. It was many days later when I learned how she came to Barranco that night of wind and rain. She had been working in the house of a vaudeville star. She was happy because the senorita was nice. And she started the story of her mishap. The younger brother, coming home only that night, had been nasty in his drunkness. She had fled from the house, from evil eyes and evil lips and evil hands that had seared her flesh with their touch. Before she finished her story, words just came out of my mouth without thinking twice. Stunned she was, but a smile again lit up her face. But I warned her, we have to wait because marriage is costly and expensive. But I will marry her because I don't want her to go back to Senorita. Never. The neighborhood in Barranco is nice, but I am not familiar with anyone. Thus, my life in Barranco with the cobbler was not what I hope it should be. He always does the things, going to the market, hanging clothes in the backyard, and work on the money for marriage. Kind days passed that I learned he barely make enough money to keep us both in rice and fish. Still, I am hoping we could save money for marriage. Somehow, nothing had been said about marriage since the night he had forbidden me to go back to the house of Senorita. I argued with myself impatiently whenever the question furtively intruded into my thoughts. When there were times when we did not have enough money for the market. Once or twice I was tempted to go to the Senorita without his knowledge. But I could not think of a good excuse to leave the house for a long time. I was not expecting this life, rather a marriage soon. There was a time when I learned how his anger, which was swift and silent and somehow terrible. I had incurred it once by making a friend of the wife of a neighbor and chatting for hours across the back fence for the sheer pleasure of hearing another woman's voice. He arrived and saw me, and he said nothing. I went up, and he was eating his meal alone, without waiting for me. Sweeping the shop one morning, the cobbler had left to deliver a pair of shoes to its owner when a small gray car made its way through the narrow street and a girl came down, staring with bewildered eyes at the small protection. It was Senorita. She came over and said she wanted to take me back. I told her the whole story of how her brother attempted to rape me until the day I found myself in the cobbler's house and his promise of marriage when we have enough money already. The senorita offered money as a salary or as a bridal gift but I refused. I told her to give the money instead to the cobbler so he would think he is paying for the license, not me. This is because I love him. From that day, I just waited for him to give me the ring. I acted normally to prevent him doubting that the senorita had come to see me. One day, 
he woke me with a surprise. He gave me a present wrapped nicely. It made me smile. As I opened it, it was a new violet scarf. I was surprised. He was happy. And there, after three days, I decided to leave, but I told him I found a new job. He stopped me from leaving, but we can't go on like this. It is not right anymore. I lied that I will be back to save money for us, but I have accepted the offer of Senorita. He gave me a bundle of clothes of his dead mother, which he had insisted for me to take. His face was pale in the late afternoon light. His hands were none too steady. I smiled compassionately divinity looking down on the puny sense of man. I smiled at him as I see him in fading darkness. Grab, go grab. Dread, 
Gengnya. <laughs>